You're watching the Retro Lube Channel. Closing time. This room won't be open. So we have Jacob Slichter, the author of So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star and drummer for Semisonic. Hey. Hey. Uh, Jake. Yes. Your book is really, really detailed, a lot of details in it. Did you keep some sort of journal or memoir, uh, like, a, like a diary while on tour, while being playing in Semisonic? So the origins of the book were some road diaries that I was writing for our fans, because at a certain point I just realized I wasn't as good a songwriter as Dan. And my song, you know, I'd get like one or two songs per record. And I just, I wanted to have a way for my voice to get out there, so I started writing uh, journal, uh, road diaries on the, on the web. Um, then, um, after the band went on break, you know, I put together a book proposal and got a book deal. When it came time to actually write the book, some of what I drew on were those road diaries. But I also would look through our old tour itineraries. And it's amazing, you know, just seeing, like, you know, Saturday, October, whatever, at Ziggy's. Salem, you know, and you're like, oh, right, that's the club where the something or other happened, and then earlier in that day, Dwayne had taken us out to lunch, and I had asked him if we were getting charged for lunch, or if it was him, or, you know, all these little details, just seeing a place and a date did a lot, and then, um, uh, you know, and I had a lot of our old video treatments lying around, um, I had old I, I watched our old videos, um, I, um, and then just most of it, you know, was in my head because it was such an incredible experience, and it happened late enough in life, it was reasonably compressed, um, that it, it was all still felt to me very fresh in my mind. Uh, speaking of touring, tell me a little bit about a little bit about the hotels and cool places you uh, got to visit while touring. Well, at the peak of our success, I mean, we were just, it was crazy, um, especially in, in Europe, in the UK. You know, we would show up, we would be chauffeured around town, um, we, we'd stay at the Kensington Garden Hotel, and, you know, you'd, you'd stay under an alias. For some reason, I don't think, it, I think the, the record company was a little, um, uh, perhaps optimistic about our need for aliases, but nevertheless, you know, we We'd, uh, my alias was Mr. Phelps from Mission Impossible. You know? So I'd get a wake-up call every morning, good morning, Mr. Phelps. And I'd wake up, and, you know, there would be a fruit basket, and I would mean, never touch it, obviously, but, uh, you know, we'd get, we'd get treated like kings, and it was, you know, crazy. Uh, and, and really fun after all those years in Super 8s, and, you know, sharing, doubling up in rooms, you know, to get, have your own multi-room suite to yourself. Can you dish a little bit about the wild times and escapades of the band <laughs> members with groupies or whatever? You know, um... You don't have to mention anything. No, I, you know, I'll, I'll just give you the, the disappointing... Well, not disappointing, but the reality, which to some people will be disappointing. Which is, we were just not one of those bands who was out, you know, bringing trains of supermodels and, you know, strippers onto our tour bus to do, you know, massive amounts of cocaine and shots of whatever. Um, we definitely, you know, Dan, our, our, Dan, who was sort of our, um, you know, our main attraction, was married. And, um, you know, he just, after every show, he'd come back to the bus and call his wife and talk for, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes. And they were actually going through a, a very tough time at, because their daughter was born right before the, you know, when we were in the stu in studio making the record that Closing Time came out on. And uh, she spent the first year of her life in the neonatal intensive care unit. So, you know, that just really is not the kind of setting for uh, um, crazy escapades. You know, he's married, they're, they're holding it together, hoping their daughter, you know, can make it through, which she did. She's fine, you know, she's hooray, she's a happy ending. Um, John had already started dating the woman who he married, um, which left me, and, um, you know, I, I just never, uh, you know, it's kind of like, do you remember the painting, if you, if you ever visit the Louvre, 
everybody goes to see the Mona Lisa. I guarantee you, if I had a thousand people who had been to the Louvre, maybe five of them could tell you what painting is next to the Mona Lisa. I don't know what it is. But anyway, so if you're in a band with like, you know, Dan is this big star and everybody sees him on MTV and all that stuff. And then John, who's, you know, sort of, Dan gets all the, like the, the, the pretty good girls and then John gets all the bad girls. And then there's Jake, you know. And um, what I found was, um, it was great. Um, I, I didn't have women beating down my door. However, my stock had risen somewhat to the point where finally I could ask out all the women who I had known for years and had been a little too shy to ask out. So now finally I felt that sort of little bit of entitlement that is required to sort of make that leap, uh, which I did. So um, the tricky part is it's just really hard to have a long distance relationship. And no matter where anybody lives, with the band touring 200 plus days out of the year, any relationship you had was going to be sort of an on again, off again kind of a deal. So it really wasn't until after the band started touring that um, uh, uh, I could get going with that. And, you know, I met my wife uh, at the end of 2001 after Semisonic, just a couple of months after Semisonic had stopped touring. Uh, so that's my happy ending. Children? No children. Not yet. Not yet. Um, you mentioned before performing and, uh, and being interviewed uh, on late, n late nights. Do you want right. to tell me a little bit about that? We never really got, in well, we got interviewed on Howard Stern, which is like the equivalent. In Actually, that was the most nerve-wracking of all. The first one we did was Conan. This was when, oh. before Conan was the Tonight Show host, when he was, you know, the, the, Conan, the late, late night with Conan O'Brien. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did them in, I think we did them in the right order and just in terms of scariness, because Conan just certainly has the friendliest vibe. Um, uh, so we did Conan first, and um, that was really, if you, having made it through that, we were able to do the others. And, and the trick to making it through that first one was to just make, in my mind, a mental checklist of what I had to do. Um, all of these shows tell you to, sh to shorten your song because they have less uh, time available for you. So we had to practice a slightly shorter version of Closing Time. And so, um, you know, you're backstage really freaking out about, you know, you don't want to mess up, you don't want to throw up and, like, be the guy who threw up on Conan. Um, <laughs> you know, you really, you're thinking those thoughts. Um, and our manager is back there saying, relax, relax, which is like the last thing that makes you relax, is someone telling you to relax. So um, we get out onto the set, and I just remember, the main thing I remember uh, is having a checklist, like, okay, um, here comes the first verse, chorus, don't rush. Okay, now we're coming, settling back into the second verse, make it a little, you know, let's, let's have a little dip here so that we can have an even bigger rush for the second chorus, those kinds of things. Switch to the hi-hat here, go to the press over there. Uh, the one other small thing I would add to that is I found out in camera rehearsal, as Dan and John were sort of looking at their pedals, their fuzz pedals and their whatever, you know, um, I was sort of, you know, trying out my drums, and I noticed every time I made a motion, all the camera guys would swoop up at me, you know, and I thought, hmm. And so uh, I, I found that if I just kept always doing the same things at the same point in the song, they'd be like, hey, that drummer is always going, he's making a big motion, to his crash, let's zoom in on him there. So um, I, I, I cleverly um, uh, manipulated, manipulated <laughs> things such that I got a little more camera time than I, than I think I would have. And this happened at every, you know, Leno, Letterman, they all had camera rehearsal and all of them would be like, so um, that was, I never shared that secret with Dan and John until I wrote the book. Speaking of manipulation, were you aware of any payola or huge amounts of money being spent on indie promoters? So I had, I didn't put it all together until I was writing the book. But what I, I mean, I remember early on hearing that we had spent half a million dollars on promotion. And I was like, how do you spend half a million dollars on promotion? And, and what is that? Um, and I just figured, you know, it was money going to people to get our songs on the radio. And I didn't really... And, and people spoke about it that as if it was legal, but we don't talk about it. Um, what I found out afterwards is it's actually, it's not really legal. Um, it's, it's, um, the way they would do it in the 90s is they would, um, 
have a guy named an uh, called an independent promoter who would go to a radio station and have a contract where he paid the radio station to be the guy who would represent them to the radio to the record companies, and then he takes a cut. Well, they take a lot of money. I mean, one of these guys, uh, I heard one year he made thirty million bucks, you know, because he controlled so many radio stations, and any record company that wanted to get songs on his stations had had to pay him off. So, um, you know, I, when I wrote the book, I found out from various people at MCA that we probably spent like seven or eight hundred thousand dollars getting closing time on all those stations. Well, those days are definitely behind <laughs> you. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, they say payola is gone. I, I, I'm not quite sure of myself. I don't. I'm not in. You know, I'm obviously not as active as I once was, but. It just seems to me when there's that much money at stake, I, I don't see how they're going to completely prevent it from happening. Ready? So, <laughs> you want to be a rock and roll star? No, I'm kidding. Um, so, you wrote this book. Right. Came out in 04. Yes. And what have you been doing since? Has this uh, been your uh, bacon? It was a little bit of bacon. Um, Similar to the music business, it's worked where they give you an advance, and then if you are sell enough to recoup your advance, uh, then you get more. And I haven't, I've yet to recoup my advance. I probably, probably won't unless they make it into a film, which someone really ought to do. But uh, there's, there's been no, uh, there's been no talk of it. I've had, I've got play a, you in a film? Well, Steve Buscemi. I can see that. Yeah, Steve, Very good call. Yeah, I, I, he, you know, it's maybe a little too late. I don't, I don't know. If, He's the kind of actor who's, you know, all these actors have much better things to do. But, you know, in, in, in the fantasy in my mind, that's who would do it. So, um, what, what, where do you live nowadays? In New York City? Yeah, I live in Brooklyn. And uh, I'm, you know, working on another book that is too vaguely conceived to really talk about because I just, I don't even really know. But it's nonfiction. Um, and I'm hoping against hope to sort of stretch a writing career together. Um, you know, this book did did pretty well, well enough to get me uh, a meeting with an editor the next time I have a book ready. Um, and um, yeah, you know, I've, I'm. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. It's it's probably too soon to tell, but if I'm able to squeeze another book out, um, then maybe good things will happen. Well, you told yourself you're going to be a rock star when you went to Harvard, and you're telling yourself you're going to be a writer now, so I'm sure it's going to happen. Thank you very much, Jake. It was Thank a you. pleasure. Me too. Time for you to go out to the places you will.